Hi, everyone. Welcome in. Uh, this is Social Media for Advocacy Part 3. I am Stephanie Vaughn, Senior Marketing Manager with Voices for Healthy Kids at the American Heart Association. Uh, this is the third installment of our social media section in our webinar series. We'll be talking about social media community management today, um, and we'll be building off our last two sessions. Um, so a couple of housekeeping items to get us started. Uh, first of all, this call is being recorded for future playback. Um, and all lines are muted, um, but we are actively monitoring the chat box, so feel free to ask any questions you may have there, and we will get to those. Um, on this next slide, you'll see that our next training in the series is highlighted here. If you have not yet registered, please watch your email following this training to make sure to register for this last one. Uh, this final session is on November 12th, and we'll have some hands-on practice and a chance to have your campaign questions answered in a skills lab format. An important heads up here, this session will be on a Thursday instead of our usual Wednesday time slot, so don't miss it. And with all of that out of the way, um, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Rihanna Kern. She is the Media Advocacy Manager at the American Heart Association, and let's get started. Thanks, Rihanna. Great. Thanks so much, Stephanie, and thank you all for joining us today for part three of our Media Advocacy Module. So like Stephanie teased for us in today's session on community management for social media advocacy, we're going to be covering these top three goals. So number one, how to respond and engage with your followers meaningfully. Number two, we'll be talking through how to build a more comprehensive community among your coalition members so that you can advance your campaigns. And then number three, we're gonna talk about how to include and connect with public officials as part of your online community members. So with that, we're going to start about um, talking about what is community management. And I think that's a big question for all of us. And then we'll start talking about how we can connect with our followers in a meaningful way. But to start, community management is the process of building an authentic community among a business's customers, employees, and partners throughout a various types of interaction. And one thing you'll note here is that the word social media is not anywhere in this definition. So while community management is something that is commonly referred to in the social media space, it does incorporate a wide variety of um, potential tactics that you're employing in your campaign. So while today we're going to focus on the social media ways that you can employ community management um, tactics, you need to be thinking about um, your community in all spaces that you're working. And I know if you're doing grassroots um, advocacy specifically, community management is really that list building and engagement and making sure people are involved. So we're going to dive in on what social media looks like from a community uh, management lens. So first, I want to give you guys a little bit of the lay of the land on what community management is um, from a strategic standpoint. And really, there are quite a few ways that you can approach community management. I think the one that I like to rely on is HubSpot's uh, space model for community management. This defines kind of the top five or so ways that you can um, move forward with a community management strategy and implementing management of your community as part of the work you're doing every day. So I'm going to talk about each of them briefly so that you can um, have a sense for what the options are available to you. And then we're going to focus in on one for the rest of this presentation. So the first one is S for support and success. This is the customer support and success model. Um, there are a few ways that you can think about a customer support approach. Um, to community management. I think one of the ways that we think about it in the social media sense most often is um, responding to comments and replies and direct messages to your pages that are asking questions. Um, people who are lost or looking for something need help. I think you look at this a lot when you see um, people tweeting at airlines wondering what happened with their flight. Um, people who had a bad experience with a product and want to return it and can't figure out what how to re-deliver things. Um, that's what that community management tactic is where there's a, you know, at American Airlines help page. The second one is product ideation, innovation, and feedback. And this is a proactive and reactive type of community management. So it requires you to create a space where your audience feels like they can share feedback and thoughts about the ways that you can innovate and improve. Um, but it's also a space where um, you can react to that kind of feedback. So you're soliciting feedback and then also reacting to it in, uh, in live time 
this is used a lot on social media when you're asking questions of your audience um, about something that you're doing. A tactic that might fall under this strategy is a digital town hall or an AMA and ask me anything post. I think we see these a lot on Reddit and then of course on live streams on websites like Twitter and Twitch. So that's um, an example of how you might use that model. The third one is acquisition and advocacy. This is just another type of community management that allows you to interact directly with the people who are most excited about your business. So in this um, space, when we're thinking about it from advocacy, the way that we can think about advocacy from policy perspective, um, the acquisition and kind of building brand ambassadors really translates to who are your top engaged advocates on the platform you're talking about? Do you have board members who are very engaged on that social media platform? Do you have champions of your issue, either public policy makers or experts in the field? And then who are your partners? Um, and really building out your community from the point of view of who are the people who are going to be our biggest advocates, whether it's literally or um, from more of that consumer perspective of what we talked about in our last webinar in the consumer marketing funnel, um, people who are feeling very loyal to your message. The fourth one, content and programming. This is um, an instance where if you're regularly creating and distributing resources, this is gonna be the community management strategy for you. And essentially, if you're doing you know, very regular webinars where you're providing information, you create one sheets, you're creating toolkits, all of those kinds of things. And that's really the base of your work that you're coming from. A community management strategy that promotes that content, promotes that programming, and is much more focused, not necessarily on coming up with new product ideas, um, not necessarily coming up with uh, brand ambassadors, not necessarily answering questions, but just truly making sure everyone has access to your content. Um, this is where you might start from. And then the last one, and this is the one we're going to talk about the most today, is the external engagement strategy. And this is what you might think of when you think of community management for social media. So this is when you're providing your audience and your supporters with a sense of belonging that leads to a stronger connection to your brand through a space that exists outside of the actual work that you do. So to put that into advocacy terms, we're thinking about building a, a community of advocates who even if they aren't working on a particular issue with us, they identify with, for example, the American Heart Association as part of their personality or as part of who they are beyond the work that they do. And one of the most common types of external engagement community management is social media management overall. So as we're walking through this presentation today, I'm gonna talk a lot more about what it looks like to do external management or external engagement. Um, but you can always be using different tactics from each of the, the models I talked about above that's best suited for the work that you do day to day. I think sometimes you're always gonna have to be doing that customer support question of someone saying, I can't find whatever resource it is on your website and you're gonna have to drop them the link or um, you're gonna have a big event coming up and you're doing a lot of that content and programming type information. But I think that's all to say it's fluid and there's always space for you to experiment, but let's just get started on the external engagement piece. So if you've joined us before, you're very familiar with this slide, but I just wanted to bring us back to the essentials for a moment. The biggest difference between running an advocacy campaign on social media and just posting on different platforms is that community management piece. And when we go back to the campaign essentials, which hopefully you have written out, sitting on your desk, sitting on your computer, sitting on a sticky note, we can come back to remembering what is the community that I want to build? What do we care about that we can think, that we think having a movement or a, a working community group can change? What do I hope that bringing all of these people together, managing a community in one space will accomplish? And those kinds of community management questions are gonna be derived from these campaign essentials. Those ideas where we're looking at what is the solution or policy 
that we're looking for? What do we want to change? What is that community management approach that we're going to take, going to do to move our campaign forward? The other slide I know you'll all be familiar with is this audience essentials piece. So we know who our power players are, what it is that we want to change. And we have to think about why we want to build a community. Who is that community? Who are the people that care about this issue area that we're trying to build a community around? If we have a few different issue areas that we work on, which I know many organizations are in that space, you may not be a, a one track focus. What is the common ground that our community management strategy will be based on? So I think one thing, for example, the AHA pushes back to all the time is our mission statement of everything for a world of longer and healthier lives. So that community management work that we're doing is to build up a group of people who all, even if you know you focus on tobacco, you might focus on nutrition, your core feeling of that community is around longer and healthier lives. And then the last thing that you wanna be thinking about when you're looking at your audiences, are we creating content or resources or just trying to provide answers to people and support those ones who are engaging with us? We need to think about, do we have something for this audience to really take away such that they feel like they're part of something and not just a follower to our pages? So essentially what we're saying is, who is the community I'm planning to manage for as we're answering these audience essentials questions. So with that, we're gonna dig a little bit more into that external engagement style of community management that we talked about. So the basic tenets of it are here and you'll notice that it is a cycle. So I'm gonna go through them in order, but they really repeat and cross over each other every single day. But with community management, um, the biggest thing I think if there's one thing on this wheel is that you have to be consistent. So this is both the engagements that you're doing with the community that you build. So commenting on posts, sharing their questions, answering their questions, but it's also a matter of, um, are you posting on a regular basis? Are you there? Are you actually being part of their lives? And I think this doesn't mean you need to post seven times a day, every day a week. But if you're going dark for weeks at a time, you're probably not managing your community in a way that's making people feel like they're involved. So you might want to look back at that second webinar where we had um, some great information from Stephanie about what are ground softening techniques and evergreen content that you can be doing. Even if your issue area isn't hot, you need to build that through line as often as you can. Second, um, if you want to differentiate your community and really serve them, you have to listen. So um, if they're leaving comments, you need to read them, think about what they mean. Are a lot of people sounding confused? Do people seem very supportive? Is nobody commenting at all? If you're listening and you're not hearing anything, you're probably not reaching the people you want to reach and you're going to want to go back to that audience essentials questions that we talked about earlier and figure out, do I have the people on my side that I'm looking for? And if not, maybe I need to build up my content before I can really start managing the community. The third part here is that you have to respond relevantly. Stephanie is gonna talk a little bit later in our presentation about what a relevant response looks like, or even when we should or shouldn't respond to something. But the most important thing that you can rely on is that if your response isn't relevant, you're not building that authentic community that we talked about in the definition of community management a little earlier. And then lastly, although everything circles back, of course, we'll go back to are we being consistent is the follow through. And on social media, we can think about this as the literal sense of the word following on social media where you should be um, regularly following using the follow button for your partners and your champions and perhaps even your top advocates. Um, but it also means that if you're going to, if you say you're going to do something, you really have to do it. So if you're saying that your community is a space that you're building and it's a place for your audience or your advocates or your partners to participate and influence the kind of information that's being presented and really be part of it, 
but what you really mean or what you really have capacity for is to broadcast and maybe answer questions sometimes, then you're not following through. You can do the latter. A lot of us only have that space for broadcast or for pretty light maintenance of our community, but you just have to be honest about that. You can't start saying that you're ready to build a network, to really build a space for everyone to participate if you're not willing to make sure that that happens. So with that, we're gonna talk about some of the basic tenants on each of the channels, um, the big three channels we've been talking about over this webinar series. So um, if there's anything that I want you to walk away with today, it's going to be these top tenants on each of the channel slides that you can just tuck into your toolbox of ways that you can improve your community's experience with your work. And I think that what's important to know is that community manager is a full-time job. People get hired, you know, for every single day of their work week to be community managers. So we can't do it all. Um, you're not going to be the Wendy's Twitter account um, overnight, but what you can do is make sure that you're incorporating these types of tactics into your campaigns so that you're getting closer to that space of the community management definition to say, I'm building an authentic community using a, a variety of interactions throughout the day or throughout the year. So, and this, um, just one more point really on all of the platforms, but you need to log in regularly. And I think that one feels like a no brainer, but if you're only using your scheduling platform to send out posts um, and not really looking at what your community is doing, then I wouldn't count that as a login. You really need to look at your page, look at how other people are experiencing what you're doing to make sure that you have a good sense of how your audience and how your community is experiencing your work. So with all that, first things first on engaging with Twitter. These are the different primary ways that you can engage with your audience. So the share, the reply, the like, the send, the follow. Share is what I think of as the retweet, quote tweet, but also that fourth section down on your, um, if you're looking at the mobile app that kind of looks like an up arrow where you can send something to someone. Um, that also falls under send, although you can think of that as direct message. So a lot of these words overlap with each other, but most likely if you are remembering to log in regularly, you're doing the liking, maybe you're even doing the sharing, you'll throw a retweet every once in a while. Potentially you got started with the following when you got started with your an account to make sure that you're not just following no one. Um, but I want you to really start trying to use all of the tools that are available to you. So if someone is asking you a question, you can reply. If you really like something that's going on and you hit the like button, consider, would it actually be helpful for my community to see this as well? Should I reply to this? Should I share it to my own page? Is there a partner who would love to see this and we can send it to them as a direct message? Is this person posting a lot of great content and I want them in my network and I should give them a follow? So don't always be too quick to move on when you see something that you like. Second, like we've discussed before, Twitter is a very timely platform. So I encourage you to check the trends often and make sure that if you have something to say, you're participating. Part of managing a community is leading in a way where you're kind of presenting to your audience what your stance is to help them make their decisions. Oftentimes we're living and breathing the advocacy messages that we're talking about, but our advocates are not. So if you can be part of the trends, giving them that perspective that they're looking for, then they have a better chance at um, feeling like they're really part of something that you're working on. And then lastly, the thing, this is a really key community management tool on Twitter is lists. So build them and use them for your daily or weekly engagement sessions that you might put on your calendar to make sure that you're uh, getting online and logging in regularly. But these could be things like um, nutrition partners or board members or city council members. So as you're running through 
your audience essentials and your campaign essentials and figuring out who do I want my community to be, silo those people out into sections that make sense for you and your organization. And then make sure that um, you also might wanna have one of people who aren't aligned with you. So what is everyone else saying? It can be helpful to know that. Um, worth noting is that you can make all of these lists private so it's visible only to you or you can make them public which means that other people can subscribe to the list beyond you. And I noticed we got a question in the chat on if we could do a little bit more explanation about trends. And this is a good question. So I think there's two places that you can look on Twitter to engage with trends. Number one is the literal um, section of the website called trends. So Twitter displays to you based on the content that you um, interact with and the people that you follow and where you even live in the country and you're signing on from. Trending topics that come up on your desktop on the right side of your screen or on mobile, you'll see them um, when you go to the search um, tab of the app. So that's one place to find out what people are talking about. And this is usually at the, the national scale. So you see big policy news there. If you follow a lot of policy people, um, you see celebrity news, those kinds of things. But the other part of trends is really, um, I think a combination of number two and three on this list, where you wanna figure out what are people talking about? You know, what is trending, even if it isn't necessarily um, nationwide news, but that people are discussing. So I think about um, when I logged on Twitter recently this week, there was a lot of conversation about school meals in the UK and whether um, students would be provided with free meals over the holidays. And with that came, I think, a secondary conversation in the US among a lot of nutrition partners and hunger advocates about what does it mean for us? Um, you know, this is a moment for us to start talking again about school meals and um, school meal access for children during COVID. So you need to be, I think, a little bit extrapolating off of the, the trending topics that you're seeing. And then also the people that are part of your community, what are they talking about? So I hope that helps. And then here, this is, a, I know, a mishmash of a slide, but this is just three examples of what community management could look like for you. So we have on the left, this is uh, the example of a share. Someone has quote tweeted and then the team um, went back and shared it back to their own page. Um, we have a quote tweet that's a little bit more like a reply. So adding some context on the top here to um, why it is that an organization is connected with one particular champion. And then down below, I have an example that looks a little bit more like that support and success model where AHA was responding to someone participating in a campaign that we were running um, and asking them to take another action. All right, now we're gonna talk about Facebook. For this one, I have four things I'd like you to walk away with. Um, as we've talked about in past webinars, different social media platforms operate very differently. So sharing is a lot faster and less cumbersome on Twitter than on Facebook, but direct conversations on Facebook are a lot easier and more contained than on Twitter. So it's easier for people to have longer conversations on Facebook that don't get lost in, uh, lost in everything else that's going on. But these are some of the basic guidelines that I want you to look at when you're doing community management on the platform. So number one, we have again, the tools that are available to you. And this is sharing, commenting, reacting, which used to just be the like button. But now if you click and hold on the like button, you have a, a myriad of reactions that you can use. Send, so this is that direct messaging aspect again. And then of course, our follow. So make sure that you're using all of the tools that are available to you on the platforms. And really the platforms will reward you for that kind of action. Um, they really, the algorithms value how much work you're putting into your community um, and recognize if your page is active and actively engaging and then treat you better for it. The second thing here 
is that Facebook is really a place that people reach out to directly. So if you're operating a business page, which I'm sure many of you are as an organization, you should be checking your messages daily. And this is because some people may not feel comfortable um, commenting on a post or they may not be able to find a post that's perfect for what their question is, but people are very happy on Facebook to send a direct message to a page and they expect to get responses there. So oftentimes you won't see anything, but it's much better for you to respond quickly um, than to not respond at all. The third one is that you should use the search function on Facebook. And I know this may sound a little bit silly, but the format of Twitter, for example, as a different social media platform, is one that allows searching um, and encourages searching a lot more than Facebook does. So this ties a little bit into our fourth one here about how Facebook is a one-to-one -one type platform, but um, Facebook pages are public. They're always a public page. So you wanna be able to find other businesses and other pages in the ways that um, aren't as that aren't as easy on a platform that's really built for people and not brands. So use the search function. If you have um, some keywords that you're often using in your post, that's a great place to start for you to search and find some of those people who you might not be engaging with um, that you wanna be engaging with. And then also to find those brands and other formal um, groups who are um, talking about your issue area. And then the last piece here, capitalize on that one-to-one -one nature. On Facebook, you're always talking to a person. So treat people like people and they will treat you the same. And this is just a quick screenshot of what it looks like um, on Facebook when you're doing things. So on the left, we see um, one brand page talking with another. There's a comment from the page that they tagged. So don't be afraid to reply as your brand page. And then on the right, we have an example of how using the search function on Facebook, you can find some of these verified pages who are talking about things who could be good champions of your issue. And then this last piece before I'm gonna pass it back on over to Stephanie, we have engaging on Instagram. So like we remember, Instagram is our big visual platform. And that also kind of changes the rules of engagement for community management here. So Instagram has some of the really um, most interesting built-in engagement tools, which lend themselves really well to those um, success and product feedback community management models we were talking about. But that doesn't mean that you can't build a very successful advocacy community on Instagram because you absolutely can. So step one, make sure you're using the tools. Save, share, comment, like, follow. At this point, I'm sure you know all of those pretty well. The one that might stand out is the save feature. It's the one that looks like a little um, bookmark icon underneath a post. This one actually, right now at least, has um, some of the highest value to the Instagram algorithm. So if you see somebody who is uh, posting content you really like, press that save button to give them a boost. Um, or encourage your followers to do the same for your posts. The second one, use those built-in engagement tools. So the biggest one is using hashtags. Hashtags are very welcome on Instagram. I know we talked about that in pre previous webinars, but you can also use those hashtags to make sure that you're engaging with different communities. Um, the second one that we'll want to talk about is the Instagram stories feature. So when you're sharing posts on Instagram, you can also post them to your stories and you can include different features like um, a specific answer box for questions. You can run a poll. Um, in many cases, you can even solicit donations um, and things like that. And I did see there was one quick question about do messages show up in your inbox? Yes, that's exactly where you should be looking for them. So. On Instagram and Facebook, if you've linked up your pages, right now they've just merged those two inbox features. So any um, direct messages you get on Instagram or direct messages you get on Facebook will all filter into one spot. So you can reply to them very quickly and easily. And then a second one, a uh, question, do platforms notify users how algorithms work or when they change? And then how do you know that saves on Instagram are heavily weighted? 
these are a lot of really great questions. I think if you're interested in learning more about social media platforms and algorithms, I would recommend looking up the website Ad Espresso. And then also I think it's Social Media Maven. And then the third is the Daily Carnage. That one's a newsletter. And those three organizations are groups that run experiments to test algorithm changes, um, especially for your ads and things like that. Um, sometimes platforms do notify users about other algorithm changes. Um, so for example, recently Facebook changed its ad requirements for images saying that you can use text in your photos for more than 15% of your space. And they posted about that on their blog. So you can subscribe to that kind of information from the channels. And then the last thing here I'll talk about on Instagram briefly is that of course you should be following, and this is more important, I think on Instagram than anywhere, um, that you can follow hashtags. So you don't have to follow every person in the world, but you can follow hashtag tobacco control. You could follow hashtag corgis of Instagram. You can follow all these things and get the top trending posts for each of those platforms, um, or rather for each of those topic areas to filter right into your feed without too much work. And then this is just a quick look at two different types of Instagram engagements. So here we see um, a page responding to someone who commented on it. I believe this is the, the advocate who's featured in the video, thanking them for using their voice. And then on the right, we see Rock the Vote reposting um, a fan account who was talking about um, voting and Minecraft. So you don't always have to be sharing things with your community that are perfectly branded, perfectly in your colors, um, perfectly messaged. You can be rock the vote and talk about Minecraft and still be building an authentic community. Okay, you've heard enough from me. I'm gonna pass it on over to Stephanie to talk about the rest of community management. <laughs> yeah, so I think one of the uh, toughest things as uh, social media professionals that we deal with um, is when do we respond to comments and when do we ignore them? Um, so, so let's start with the general principle of engagement here is to respond as prudently as possible. And um, you know, the need to understand the full context of a message is critical before you reply. So one fundamental tip, and I think this is probably a good life tip in general, is to always pause and take a breath before you reply. Um, especially with the current state of social media, um, there's a lot of negativity going on, so don't fall into that trap. Um, avoid responding on impulse and take time to evaluate the best course of action. Um, it's important to never respond when you're angry. Even um, the most minimal negative sentiment can impact how your message is interpreted. Um, and I think maintaining a positive state of mind, even in the midst of that negativity or distraction, um, will really impact the outcome of your engagement effort. Um, so philosophically, just putting that out there first before we really dig in. Um, but I think whether online or offline, uh, the philosophy of engagement should be the same. We want to be helpful. We want to provide people with education and information that empowers them. So. On the next slide, let's talk about uh, navigating when and how we respond to something. Um, so um, that depends on your organization and its policies. I personally recommend having guidelines that cover two different areas, um, rules for your accounts and then rules for responding to comments on those accounts. Um, so let's first talk about rules for your accounts. Um, this is a set of internal guidelines. You know, this covers things like tone, messaging, personality, frequency of posting, things like that. Um, this is how you regulate staff behavior to make sure that you're in alignment in that public forum. Um, but I think for this conversation today, the major focus is going to be on the second one that you see here, and that's dealing with responses to your posts. So how are you going to handle those negative comments, um, challenging comments, uh, criticisms? Um, this is how you handle your audience behavior. Um, so as a heads up, if you are uh, an American Heart Association staff member, we actually have these guidelines already. Um, they are in the Social Media Center for Excellence. Uh, so make sure you check those out. All right, so on this next slide, um, let's just quickly talk about uh, your own internal guidelines. Rihanna touched on this already. Um, 
but you can't go wrong with three rules of engagement. Um, make sure your accounts and posts are transparent. Users want to know who the organization is and what you stand for. Um, protect. So this is making sure what you post is something your organization is comfortable with. Um, you know, in our work in public policy campaigns, we have a lot of strategies that we may not want to share publicly. Um, so, you know, just use common sense there. Um, and, and that takes you to the third one, common sense of being professional. Um, what you post can't be taken back. So even if you delete it off your account, it can live on in a screenshot or an archive. So just proceed with caution and use common sense before you hit that send button. Um, and then the second part of this slide, I just wanted to throw this in uh, because I think it's a really helpful tool. A tool. Um, think before you post is just a general line of questioning to help you create content. Um, just questions like, does this post have value? Does this fit with your organization's missions? Things that help you decide whether or not you should post something. Um, it's just a nice way to make sure that what you're posting is relevant, it's helpful, and, and it's a good use of your time. Okay, so that's the easy part. Um, that's the uh, part you have control over. So now let's talk about dealing with audience behavior. So I like to think of this as how do we deal with negative comments on our accounts? Um, and this is a moderation strategy for your accounts. But um, before we talk about how to deal with those responses, let's think about the types of risks that we could encounter. Um, and so you, I think you can put these into two different areas, user risks and then reputation risks. So user risks are some of those more in your face obvious ones, right? Like um, having somebody post, uh, post profanity, maybe abusive language, calling for violence, um, things like that. Um, these are the things that you read and immediately, you know, are like, whoa, this is a problem and obviously something has to be done immediately. Um, reputation risk, on the other hand, I think um, take a little bit more thought and strategy and responding. So this is when someone may oppose your issue area or they don't agree with your policies or the campaign you're running, something like that. Um, and so we see a lot of this. Uh, we see this around sugary drinks. We see this around um, some of our COVID-19 posts, some of our healthcare content. Um, responding to this takes more thought, more strategy, um, but this is the type of risk that you're probably going to encounter most. So what do we do about these types of comments? Um, well, uh, that depends on your moderation strategy. Um, and I am sorry to say there is not an easy one size fits all approach uh, to this that I can share with you. Um, I can't tell you how to respond to a specific comment with an exact answer, you know, or delete this comment or ban this user. Um, it entirely depends on your organization and how they want to handle each situation. Um, Moderation plays a significant role in ensuring the development and sustainment of your online community. Um, so this requires an effort not only to listen to the conversations that are happening on live, but to be an active participant and even a role model in your community. Um, you have to listen to what people are saying to know how to respond. You can't just push out information. Um, so your moderation plan needs to have a few components. Um, it needs to have guidelines. And so you can think of these as the house rules of what is acceptable and what isn't. Um, a schedule um, to make sure you know how often you should be reviewing comments. Um, and this is that listening element. And then an escalation chart. And um, this is an important piece. This is who is going to make decisions about responding to comments, especially in a crisis situation. Um, who has that authority to say, yes, post that. We're good with it as an organization. Um, so there will be situations where you encounter posts or comments that may require you to take action um, as a community manager. Um, and those actions will vary depending on the nature of the post, and it may, you know, range from guiding a conversation that has gone off track, um, you know, to removing a post um, that degrades a member of your community, or in some cases, you'll, you know, determine that no response may be the best course of action because it may only fuel the fire of that negative conversation. Um, so when thinking about all of this, be sure that you take time to consider the context of the post that you're responding to and the perspective of the author. Um, and additionally, it's important to be mindful of the channel the post is located on because this will impact your ability to moderate. So for example, platforms like Twitter don't have the ability to moderate. Um, anyone can comment and you don't have the ability to delete, whereas on Facebook, you can delete comments. Um, so when you're thinking about how to respond um, maybe to a negative comment or to a bad situation, 
you need to think about the ability of your platform to show. Um, so with that being said, let's talk about criticism um, versus trolling. So um, on this next slide, um, you're gonna see four questions here. People are gonna disagree with you and they're going to be vocal about it. That's the nature, uh, nature of social media, that's reality. So here are four questions I think are really helpful um, to consider if you encounter negative or adverse comments. Um, is this something that will ultimately be detrimental to my community? Is this person trolling, link baiting, spamming, harassing someone on my page? And so what is trolling? Trolling is um, when people intentionally um, leave offensive or provocative messages to get attention, to cause trouble, or to upset someone. So they're not adding to the conversation. They're trying to be a distraction. Um, third question, will responding lead to positive engagement? Or is no response the best course? And then fourth, what platform is this post located on? I think that these are four basic questions that'll help guide that approach, whether you're going to respond or to ignore. Um, on this next slide, I threw this in because I think it's super helpful um, to have an engagement decision tree within your organization. Um, it'll help you, uh, it'll help guide you to respond to comments, especially in crisis situations. Um, Sometimes I think uh, because of the nature of social media and how fast it moves, once somebody posts a negative comment, uh, you have to quickly make a decision before things snowball and grow. Um, so you'll see this uh, example of an engagement tree. Um, I like this one, but yours will be unique to your organization. Um, and I know it's super small text, but I can tell you that it covers a few, uh, few key factors. Um, so the type of comment, is it negative, neutral, or positive? whether or not that comment needs to be escalated for consideration, um, then the type of response needed, and then finally, who is going to make that decision on behalf of your organization? So for example, like, do we need to run this response by the legal department before we respond? Is it something um, overall that reflects on the organization? So we need to have an extra set of eyes to make sure what we're saying is true, factual, um, and representative of our organization. And I think the key here is having a plan in advance uh, it'll help you quickly navigate responses and make decisions under pressure. Um, advanced preparation will make your job so much easier, especially in tough situations. Um, so on this next slide, we're talking about something a little bit more specific here. So up to this point, we've been talking about dealing with comments on organic posts. Um, so what do we do about paid posts? When you see an organic post, um, that's just the usual post or tweet you send out. So who sees that? Your followers see it, maybe your followers' friends who can see that they've commented on it, and then maybe people who visit your page. Um, people typically have to act actively seek you out to see that post. Ads, on the other hand, have a large reach. Um, they can reach people who may not be a fan of your work, and depending on how you are targeting those ads, and depending what your strategy is. So with that in mind, there is potential here for more negative comments than you would see on your organic post. Um, so a question before you run an ad, is your messaging somewhat controversial? Are you expecting pushback? And I think sometimes in the work that we do, we face a lot of pushback, right? Because we're talking about passing policies that um, you know, not everybody agrees with. So if you are anticipating negative comments or pushback, um, prepare in advance. Um, anticipate you know, potential crises, uh, any kind of um, language that you may want to use in your response, try to prepare, prepare that ahead of time. Um, if people are ganging up on you online um, you know, in regards to one topic, um, how you can effectively respond to their questions um, and also stir the conversation towards something more positive, can you do that with a new comment? Um, you can do that with pre-planning. So have a set of messages uh, for your topic ready to go. So our Voices for Healthy Toolkits have a lot of messaging resources and fast facts that can help you with that. Um, you shouldn't ignore or run away from negative crit criticism. It can actually be an opportunity to better explain your position and correct any kind of misconceptions that are out there. So for example, um, say your issue area is sugary drink taxes and you, someone posts that taxing sugary drinks doesn't work. Well, you can use this um, as an opportunity to educate. 
you could respond with a link to a study that shows why your sugar agent policies do work um, and how and why your organization supports them. Um, it's all about preparation and anticipation of pushback. You can have those responses ready to go in advance. Um, and so it creates a positive opportunity for you. Um, and it's also a good opportunity, um, aside from that, to identify opposition messaging. Um, you know, you can see what people are saying, take notes, and, and figure out how you can use those opposition messages um, in your campaign, how you can answer those. Um, so what about um, comments on the ad that aren't legitimate criticism? Um, what if it's a troll who's just posting something nasty or abusive? Um, your response will depend on that engagement plan from the previous slide that you should work on in your organization. Um, but I will say you shouldn't be afraid to delete or ban people who are posting profanity, um, racist comments, or threatening and abusive language. And it happens. Um, there's a difference between harassment and disagreement. Um, people can disagree with you. Um, that's fine. Like I said, it's an opportunity to maybe correct um, some assumptions or incorrect information. Um, harassment's not okay. And you can delete that. <laughs> you can delete those comments. You can ban those users. There is a line between the two. Um, so yeah, work with within your organization in advance um, to make some of these decisions on how you want to handle it um, because these situations do move quickly and it is really helpful to kind of have an idea of what you want to do beforehand in case you encounter these. So with that being said, let's move on um, to talk about building a comprehensive community among coalition members. So there are um, a lot of different options here. Um, it's What's fun about this um, is that our advocacy work is strengthened by numbers. Um, we want more advocates speaking up for us. Um, so how do we do that? Um, we do that by working with other organizations. And this is true for social media as well as all of our offline work. Um, so how do you work with all of your allies and friends informally? Um, it's pretty easy, actually. You just jump in. So identify who your allies, partners, friends are on social media accounts, follow their accounts, monitor those accounts, and look for opportunities to interact. So whether it's retweeting or commenting on a post, these organic uh, interactions will help build your relationship while also promoting that interaction for the public to see. And so this can bring in new followers and supporters. Um, it also helps spread that conversation to more eyes across social media channels. And why does that help? It helps because it lays the groundwork for future advocacy asks and positions your organization as a go-to resource in that specific subject you're posting about. So with that being said, let's move to the next slide and let's talk about the different ways of informal partner engagement. So I like to think of this as the we've got your back social media strategy. Um, so there's a few different ways to easily get involved, uh, get involved with holidays and awareness months. So in the public health world, we have a ton of awareness days and months. Um, these are great conversation starters online. Check out what some of your allies are posting, see how you can coordinate um, and respond to those messages. Uh, Twitter chats. So these are conversations on Twitter connected through a specific hashtag. You may have all have seen uh, Moms Rising weekly food Friday chat. So these chats will have a specific topic and questions to answer. And the questions are usually an opportunity for your organization to identify why a specific er issue area is a problem, what needs to be done to fix it, and how you are fixing it. So it's an opportunity to connect with your partners while promoting your own work and resources. Um, and it's also a good avenue for promoting current calls to action or petitions that you may have going on. Um, this third, retweeting and responding, super straightforward, and Rihanna mentioned this earlier, you see one of your allies' accounts posting a news article about an issue area, you know, comment on it and share it. It helps boost their engagement numbers, it helps your account get noticed, and hopefully in the future, um, that part of organization will return the favor when you post. Uh, and then this last thing, um, I love these, partner toolkits. Um, so this is when you create some social media messages and graphics to share with other organizations um, in hopes that they will in fact share them um, and, and post them on their accounts. So on this slide, you'll see a snapshot of our promotional toolkit we recently created to support our 2020 progress report. Um, we do these for our major releases um, and we receive these a lot uh, at Voices for Healthy Kids and we do typically share posts from our friends and partners. It shows the public that we support another organization 
and then it helps our own promote promotion when these organizations are willing to share content in the future. So you'll see it just has um, some graphics, it has some sample social media, um, and it has a, a news alert blurb in this case. Uh, but the point here is to make it easy for others to share your content. The easier it is, the more likely they are to do it, and we'll help you bring them later in the future. So with that, I will turn it back over to Rihanna to talk about formal coalition work. Thanks so much. And I think um, as you're looking at this slide, you'll see that a lot of what we do as a formal coalition on social media is very similar to what Stephanie was just talking about for those informal, more um, partner um, connections that we have with the people who work in our area. But there are a few things that I just wanted to highlight that you can do a little bit differently when you have that official grouping of a coalition where, you know, you have anywhere from 20 to 160 organizations who have come together under a formal name, um, you'll want to think about some of these things. So the one piece that you should always be doing as a formal coalition is amplifying your success. I think the, the value of bringing together many organizations in an official way is that you're saying all of us fall under this umbrella. And so any success that you have needs to be amplified as that umbrella. Um, this doesn't mean that you can't or that you shouldn't as an individual member of a coalition talk about something um, from your own point of view, but amplifying the formal coalition itself has value um, for building up name recognition. And then for that community management point of view, you want people to be aware that you're part of something bigger because it helps them feel like they are part of something bigger too. The second piece, we want to share news to do that recap and remind cycle. If your coalition is mentioned in a news article, um, either formally by name or as um, I think Politico does this often where they say 70 plus um, groups who care about X, Y, Z issue came together to send a letter to the Hill, um, share news about that and recap for people what the issue is and then remind them why you've come together um, with this group. The next one is creating a pod, and I think this is uh, very similar to what Stephanie was just talking about for that um, informal partnership working, but it's just more of an official group of people who have all agreed that they will engage with each other's content in a timely matter to make in a timely manner to make sure that all of those posts get a little bit more love from the platform that they're on. So an engagement pod is something you might be, you may have heard of as an Instagram um, influencer technique where, you know, 20 people who all go on the same vacation post at the same time and then comment on each other's pictures and share them and blah, blah, all of that. We can use that in advocacy. We're probably not going to any tropical islands anytime soon, but if we're all working together on a virtual lobby day or your formal coalition, like I said, is sending a letter to the Hill or CMS or wherever it is, um, agree to work together in an engagement pod to get that, um, to get all of that news or all of the work that you're doing seen through the work of each other. And then the last thing here is that if you're working in a formal coalition, you can be setting goals. So this is to say that your communications folks who may be um, working as part of that coalition can say, we want to, um, as a coalition, we want to have the goal of getting engagement from members of Congress with our coalition on social media. And with that, you can really approach your community management strategy to make sure that you're focused towards that person as your audience um, in a meaningful way. And then on the right here, just some reminders you'll want to think of. If you create a formal coalition property, so you create, say, at Healthcare Coalition on Twitter or on Instagram, this account needs to be the biggest supporter of your cause, or you have just created internet crumbs. There is very little value to creating another channel for your formal coalition space if it's not going to be loud and proud about all of the work that you're doing. So if this is recommended at the start of your coalition or in one of your meetings, there needs to be very strict roles assigned for who is populating this, who's keeping it going, what are we putting on it? Otherwise, 
that work can be done through the work of your members. Um, and that's what I mean by saying they should be the driver of community building um, if you are creating a formal property. The other thing to consider is that for your coalition members, um, provide and use toolkits. Like Stephanie said, people love them and they use them if you give them to them. Um, set some weekly, monthly, quarterly standards to say, as a coalition member, you should post three times over the next month about XYZ thing in our toolkit. You can set those standards if you guys are in a formal partnership. And the last thing is that if you as a policy person are um, part of a coalition, try to encourage a, a subgroup for social media to incorporate your comms folks so that they have an opportunity to connect with each other and you'll have a much better chance of making sure that your content ends up on the editorial calendar that they're building. I know that I always appreciate when I'm looped in early um, before something is going out so that I know what it is that I may want to be posting on the AHA channels. And then I know we only have a few minutes left, um, so I'm just gonna head right into our section about connecting and including public officials. And I know you've seen the slide a million times, but I just want you to remember who your main audience is. You need to use these direct connections you're doing on social media wisely. Yelling to someone who cannot help you or encouraging someone who is adamantly against, against your cause, it may not always hurt you, but it will always be a waste of your time. Public officials should be a key part of your community management strategy, but you have to think about that common ground before you know if you're willing to build them into your community. So the big question for everyone here, I know, is this lobbying? And the answer is maybe. <laughs> if you're concerned or you have restricted funding um, or you're not sure and you're a grantee on the call, I really recommend that you talk to the voices team. Um, reach out to Stephanie, she can help you figure out um, who it is that you need to talk to to figure out what you can and can't do. Um, oftentimes this is most relevant when you have ad budget. So that's when you'll want to be thinking about it. Um, that moment when you're moving from the people that you know to people who don't know you yet. Um, but the one thing you can lean on is that individuals can always be talking to their public officials. So don't be afraid as an advocate or as an organization to encourage your advocates to speak up, use their voice and tag their members of Congress, their city council members, their local water board into things because they need to be hearing from the people that they represent. So with that, um, I'll leave you with these thoughts to think about working with officials, as I'm sure all of us know from the policy side is a give and a take. And this applies to social media community management too. So you wanna thank, encourage and contextualize your champions when they're talking about something or when they've done something for you. Um, did they post a letter that they sent to colleagues? Did they champion your issue? Post about them on social, tag them in your posts. Um, if you have a direct connection with their office, maybe give them a heads up that you'll be doing this and see if they'd be willing to retweet you, reshare you on Facebook, um, include your video on their Instagram story. You can make those asks and they may not always say no, but building that community requires communication. And then the take side of this as well, hold your champions and your public officials accountable. Don't be afraid to tag pages if you know that a vote went through that didn't turn in your favor and that you're ready to keep moving on on your issue. Um, use that recap and remind cycle for your community management here, where you're letting people know why it is that you're taking this person to task if you think that's the right approach um, and remind them what it is that they can do next to make sure that they're feeling your audience, the people who you're talking to, feel like something more and that they feel like it makes sense that you're trying to bring the official into that space. So with that, if there are any other final questions, feel free, please, to drop them in the chat. Otherwise, join us for part four of our webinar. Um, like Stephanie said, that's on Thursday, November 12th. I think that's the right date um, with the Skills Lab and Office Hours. So come with questions, come with campaigns. We're ready to talk to you. And otherwise, take the 10 question eval in the chat. We want to hear from you. Make sure this was helpful. And thank you so much.